Okay, welcome to video nine, Introduction to Plato. This is our first video of the Plato unit. So we are now, we are moving from warring states China across uh, the continent of Eurasia to ancient Athens. Uh, we're also moving a little bit in time, but mostly we're just moving in space. I'm gonna give you a bit of historical background and some biographical background on Plato and Socrates. And then we'll talk about the exercise that I had you do before the video um, and how this relates to epistemology and the first big contrast uh, we're going to be drawing between Plato and Confucius. So ancient Athens is sometimes referred to as the cradle of democracies democracy. And in some way that ways that's true, and in other ways it's not. It wasn't really that democratic, and to the extent it was, uh, there were other examples from the same era, for instance in India. So we're actually looking at an exact date here. 399 BCE is when Socrates was executed. Um, so we can say uh, we're, we're looking at a pretty concrete place and time. We're look, uh, in 399 BCE, um, Athens was uh, a lar one of the largest cities in its region. It had about 140,000 residents. 40,000 of them were voting citizens. Um, and so in that extent, it was a democracy. Um, and power was fairly evenly shared um, across those 40,000 citizens. Uh, but, you know, they were not the majority by a long shot of the, uh, of the city. So in some ways, rather than it being a democracy, I sometimes think of it as an, oligop an oligarchy with an unusually large and argumentative ruling class. Um, and it is this culture of argument in the ruling class, the large ruling class, that helped give birth to democracy in the uh, European American tradition. So um, who were the non-citizens? Well, women, obviously, slaves, uh, youth under the age of 20, and foreigners. There was a large immigrant population in Athens because it was a mercantile city. Okay, so women were largely confined to the home, especially women who were citizen, uh, that is, uh, not citizens, but uh, Athenian women. They were native women. Um, the Athenians distinguished strongly between native Athenians and people from other, they would call them races, right? Um, and so the chastity and purity of native women was highly prized and they were kept um, largely confined to the home. But uh, the pub, there were plenty of other women who were in public, slave, mostly slaves and foreigners. Slavery in Athens was not as brutal as it was in other places. In particular, it was not nearly as brutal as it was in ancient Sparta. Ancient Sparta, uh, the rival city-state to Athens, functioned a lot like the agrarian south prior to the Civil War. There was a slave caste that did all the farming uh, and was kept down by a um, ruling class that was heavily honor oriented. Um, and so a lot of the stuff you see in movies these days about the kind of honor society or the really proto-fascist society of um, Sparta was about keeping down the slave class who were called the helots. And the helots were ethnically homogeneous um, uh, so that made it the easier for them to organize, unlike the slaves who were uh, taken to the United States who came from all over the uh, western coast of Africa and had disparate religions and languages. Um, so, yeah, 
Slavery in Sparta was like antebellum southern slavery. It was really brutal. Slavery in Athens was not as bad um, most of the time. There were some mines. There were mining operations that were run by, uh, that were staffed by slaves that were that worked the way that slavery did in Athens in the Old South, where they just calculated how much work you could get out of, of a um, uh, out of a person until you killed them and maximized the value. You know, just work people to death. Um, but uh, uh, more often, slaves were members of households, uh, low-level members of aristocratic households, and had a fair amount of autonomy. They could even be considered skilled laborers. Foreigners included merchants, uh, workers, and prostitutes. Like I said on the previous slide, um, Athens was a trading city um, and uh, a naval power. So they a lot of people came from many foreign um, uh, cities. Okay, so the first philosophers. Philosophy as we know it in the West begins with Socrates. Um, there are a class of philosophers uh, in the Western tradition called the pre-Socratics, but you can tell by their name that they're, you know, they're, they're sort of prehistory. They're before the original philosopher um, in the European tradition, Socrates. Most of what we know about Socrates comes through one student of his, Plato, right? Uh, when we were looking at Confucius, we saw that Confucius interacted with a lot of different students and there was an oral tradition uh, and eventually the sayings of Confucius became, were written down. With Socrates, um, people were writing down stories about him while he was still alive. And Plato started writing down stories about him almost immediately after his death. The, and so you might think this that we have more contact with the historical Socrates than we do with the historical Confucius. But we also know for a fact that it was part of the literary genre of writing stories about what Socrates taught, that you were just allowed to make stuff up. Um, so Plato wrote dialogues featuring Socrates um, as the teacher figure, but we, uh, we know uh, at least half of it, if you can somehow count it, was just stuff that Plato made up. Um, uh, the other people who wrote about Socrates confirm some points um, and not others. So, okay, tradition. According to Socrates, uh, he was born into a wealthy aristocratic family around 470 BCE. Uh, and like I said, he died in 399 BCE. Um, so he was uh, about 70 years, 71 years old. Um, his family was part of the ruling class. They were citizens who could vote, that is, the men in his family who were over 20. His mother was a midwife. His father may have been a stonecutter. They were well connected uh, to the highest levels of government in Athens. Uh, Socrates is known to have served during the Peloponnesian War against Sparta. He married a woman named, named Xanthippe and had three sons. Uh, but none of this makes him the founder of philosophy in the European tradition. Um, what made him uh, the, philosoph uh, the founder of philosophy in the European tradition was how he lived his life. He would hang around in public places and talk with people about what the, he, they thought they knew. So these conversations, especially as Plato recounts it, focus on what we now call Socratic questions. Uh, and they're all questions of the form, what is X? Where X is generally some sort of moral term. What is virtue? What is bravery? What is justice? Uh, that sort of thing. 
What is beauty? What is friendship? Um, and so the, 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 the shtick is that it inevitably comes out uh, in these conversations um, that uh, the person Socrates is talking to doesn't really know the concept, but there are always people who are supposed to know the concept, right? So uh, he'll talk to a general about bravery, and it turns out the general doesn't know what bravery is. In the first dialogue we're going to read, he talks with a religious leader named Euthyphro. Um, and he asks Euthyphro, what is uh, piety, holiness? What does it mean for something to be godly? Piety is the word that is is used. Um, and Euthyphro just doesn't know. Um, and so these are the conversations that Plato reports to us. So we can see some contrasts with uh, Confucius already. Um, Socrates is a teacher, and we have records of the conversations that he had, but he wasn't an official teacher. He did not have students who paid him money. Confucius says that he um, will, you know, accept whatever uh, payment his students can afford as long as it's given in the proper ritual fashion. Socrates doesn't have official students. Um, he actually is just harassing people in public. Rather than people coming to him um, and saying, please teach me, he's like, hey, you over there, do you know things? What do you think? Do you, do you know what you think you know? Um, and so this made him an interesting figure, and that's why uh, uh, other people in, in Athens at the time started telling stories about him, including the ones that Plato reports to us. Okay, so 399 BCE, Socrates is charged with heresy and corrupting the youth. Um, he was uh, 71 years old, um, but he was still considered a threat. Why is that? Well, um, Athens had just lost the war with Sparta. And standard operating procedure in um, ancient Greece at the time was that when you defeated a city-state, you killed all the men and sold the women and children into slavery. And so the Athenians were anticipating that this would happen to them. Um, and it didn't. Uh, instead, the government was... Uh, overthrown and replaced with a with a sort of a puppet government, a military junta known as the 30. Um, and then even after that, and there were there were there were massive purges after that, uh, but uh, the democracy was eventually restored. But the government was still unstable. It was a time of chaos and someone like Socrates, who was a disruptive influence, represented a threat. So they killed him. Um, and after his death, Plato began to write uh, dialogues. The first dialogue he wrote was an account of the trial. Uh, we have other accounts of the trial of Socrates, and they confirm some details and not others. Um, Plato uh, never went on to found a regular school, a, 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 an academy that accepted students. Um, and, uh, well, uh, so some interesting things about Plato's academy. He is, his academy accepted women. At least two, two women were known to have studied with Plato. Uh, Lasthenia, Lasthenia, Lasthenia of uh, Manatea, and Axiothea of Phleas. According to one source named Diogenes Laertius, Axiothea uh, wore men's clothes. So she um, traveled, she was a foreigner who had traveled to Athens for the sake of studying with Plato. Um, and at the time, a woman traveling alone would have been in a great deal of danger. So one possibility is that she was near, she was disguising herself as a man to uh, uh, avoid danger. Another possibility is that she was 
uh, trans in some way in modern terminology. Uh, however, saying that would have been it is going to be bound to be um, anachronistic. And you know we know about this person from a basically two paragraphs in a book by Diogenes Laertius called Lives of the Philosophers. So we don't know. Um, a lot is going to be speculative and reconstructive. But in any case, the deal is that Plato said that anyone with talent should be educated, even women. Um, it, the, his point was a, basically one of meritocracy. If you have talent, you should be educated. Um, and, you know, this is sometimes thought of as being more feminist than it actually was, because it's not like he, Plato thought that women would be talented that often. He just thought that if they were talented, they should be educated. And this was enough to inspire Axiothea uh, to travel from Phleas to uh, Athens um, to uh, study with Plato. So that's, that's interesting. Okay. Um, so Plato's dialogues are broken up into three periods. This is the standard way of doing it. Um, and it's, it's got a fair amount of historical evidence backing it up. The idea is that the earliest dialogues that Plato wrote were more straightforward, factual accounts of what Socrates actually did. Um, and all of these, uh, this includes Euthyphro and Apology they, and Crito, um, the most of the dialogue we're reading. Um, they begin with uh, Plato asking about a term. And our big example here is going to be Euthyphro, um, where Plato asks, what is piety? Or so Socrates asks, what is piety? Um, and the, the person that they're talking to, in this case, Euthyphro, tries to give some examples. He sputters around. He can't really come up with a definition. And the dialogue ends, in, um, uh, the dialogue just ends without any resolution. The longer Plato went on, the more he started representing his own views through the mouth of Socrates. So we're going to just read a tiny snippet of one of the middle period dialogues, Phaedo, where Socrates argues for the immortality of the human soul. But this is probably not what Socrates himself did. This is Plato who believed in an immortal human soul um, and putting his arguments in the mouth of Socrates. Um, and at the beginning, these actually kind of start out like, um, early dialogues and then they just take a left turn. Oh, and we're also going to read a little bit of Republic again, just a single passage, um, which is from this middle period. Um, by the end of Plato's career, he just had a character laying everything out. Um, and the character might not even be Socrates, it might be someone else, but it was more just Plato describing his own viewpoint. All right, uh, some vocabulary words for talking about Plato and Socrates. Alenchus means cross-examination. This is a common word for the way that Socrates questioned people. And it was also the word that the Greeks used to uh, refer to a cross-examination in a court of law. So it was, it's really pretty, pretty straightforwardly like our term cross-examination. Um, but this is the Socratic method of questioning people. And we will get to that. Uh, once we get into Euthyphro, you'll see how that works. Another important term is aporia. It literally means impasse. Um, all of the early dialogues end in aporia. There's no resolution. Socrates asks questions. He isn't satisfied with his answers and the dialogue ends. In the later dialogues, Plato starts feeding answers that he thinks are the correct ones and he puts them into Socrates' mouth. 
Um, but, but these are clearly Plato's ideas and not Socrates's. And we actually have some idea where Plato was getting his positive doctrine, his, the ideas that weren't from Socrates. Um, and we'll talk about that as well when um, we get to some of the middle period dialogues. All right, so in the exercise I had you do, um, I ask you to tell me a story about the time you realized someone didn't know what they were talking about. Um, and then when I do this in person, you share this with a partner, you compare um, what was the topic, and how did you realize they didn't know what they were talking about? So this is meant to um, bring out sort of how ordinary actually the Socratic situation is. Socrates questioned people who thought they knew stuff, and it turns out that they were bullshitting, that they didn't know what they were talking about. And so the interesting thing is, how do you tell that someone is, doesn't actually know what they're talking about? So um, often, well, when I do this exercise, I get many different kinds of answers. Actually, it turns out that the most common answer, as near as I can tell, is not is simply that the person who says they know something is corrected by another person who has more authority and says they know something, right? So someone will say they know stuff about cars, and then you'll talk to another car mechanic who knows more and says that they're wrong. Um, the other common situation is for someone to say they know something and then fail what uh, I would think of as the Confucian test. They can't actually do it. So someone will say they know how to fix cars, um, and uh, then when actually called on to fix a car, they can't, right? So for Confucius, the test of knowledge was doing. Um, and a lot of people in this exercise will give um, examples where people fail the Confucian test of knowing. So all of this is really about um, epistemology, right? Epistemology is uh, the, I defined this in my very first video, it's the study of knowledge, what it is and how to get it. Um, and that contrasts with the two other big areas of philosophy that we talk about in these courses, metaphysics and ethics. But epistemology is the study of knowledge, what it is and how to get it. And so one way you can figure out what knowledge is, is to look at how you tell that people don't have knowledge. For Confucius and for a lot of people um, uh, in the exercise, uh, you tell that people, someone doesn't have knowledge because uh, they can't actually do what they say they can do. It's a pragmatic thing. Um, also, honestly, most people, most of the time, our knowledge comes from authority. We, that is to say, we don't learn everything on our own. We learn it from other people. Um, and so a lot of times uh, when people uh, turn out to not know something, it's because they get corrected by someone else who's also a, a, a knower but has more authority. There's a third way, though, of um, understanding what... Um, uh, of seeing whether or not someone knows something. And this is whether or not they can explain it. And this is actually what Plato is going to do. And we'll talk about this more when we get into Euthyphro. So in any case, that's epistemology. It's separate from metaphysics, which is the study of existence, and ethics, which is the study of right and wrong. Um, and we're going to talk about metaphysics and ethics in Plato as well. But mostly our focus is going to be on epistemology. Okay. Um, and so uh, I'm going to give you a bit of vocabulary um, and then we'll start comparing some epistemologies. So um, the, 
The word empirical means relating to the evidence that comes from the senses, right? Um, so experience. Um, if you could, if if you know something because you see it, seeing is believing kind of knowledge. That's empirical knowledge. I um, mean, these days, empirical knowledge is a for you know. A contemporary United States culture, empirical knowledge is really the default. Americans are quite uh, uh, quite comfortable saying that seeing is believing. There's an alternate route to knowledge, um, allegedly, that gets called a priori knowledge. A priori just means from the prior. Um, and this is knowledge gained by reason alone, without sensory experience. And this is the kind of knowledge that um, that uh, Plato is going to emphasize, and we're going to see how this comes out in the dialogues. Okay, so we can also think about this in terms of a three-way contrast. So you read Confucius. For Confucius, knowing is doing, and I'm going to label this pragmatism. For Plato, knowing is a priori. Uh, your senses deceive you. And that should be a familiar enough experience. You know your senses can deceive you. Um, and so knowledge actually comes from within, not from outside, but from within, um, from pure rationality. Uh, later in the course, we're, we're going to get to David Hume. And Hume is a much later thinker, but he establishes what is now, I've I feel like a lot of common sense in U.S. culture, uh, empiricism, that all knowledge must in some way relate back to sensory content. Okay, so uh, this is the first page of the Euthyphro from one of the oldest documents uh, where the dialogue has been written down. Uh, this was written in, written down in 895 CE in Constantinople. So, you know, like a thousand years after the death of Socrates, but this is our oldest written example of it. Um, and I like old manuscripts. You can find this online. Um, the uh, So we're reading the Euthyphro. The Euthyphro takes place right before Socrates' trial. Plato imagines that right before Socrates' trial, he has a conversation with another person who is also going to trial. Um, and this other person uh, is a religious leader. He claims to be able to see the future in particular. Uh, he's a religious prophet. Um, there's no other record of him. He may be a, a fictional character. Um, but uh, Socrates asks him what holiness or piety is. Now, what does it mean for something to be religiously good? Piety. Um, and, that, well, and, well, we'll see what happens. <laughs>